So this meeting is also going to be recorded and I'll be able to upload this to YouTube after the event. So I'll send out a link to people if you're interested in that. So we're going to be talking about breach and attack simulation open source tools. It's a new term that's come about uh, end of 2017, 2018. And so we'll be talking about that and how it can help with your network. Just a quick introduction about myself. My name's Warren Finch. I've been working with APNIC for just over six months. Before that, I worked for a managed service provider. And my areas of interest is security, routing and switching, and also anything to do with virtualization and automation. I really like to focus on those areas, hence the breach and attack simulation tools. So what I hope to go through in this short time is an overview of what breach and attack simulation is, then why would you use these breach and attack simulation tools, an overview of the MITRE attack matrix, and then I'll list some of the open source tools. Now there's lots of different tools out there and they're getting released all the time. So I've only limited to a few specific tools. And so I'll go through each of those tools and explain a little bit about those. And I may go through setting up a simulation on a few of those tools. I was planning to do it for all of those, but in one hour, that's a lot of work to go through those. So we'll just go through a few of those and talk about how to set those up. <clears throat> so what is breach and attack simulation? What it means is basically to simulate adversarial activities of some degree of automation if possible. It's a way of testing your defences to make sure that what you've got in place is actually detecting any sort of unusual activity or adversarial activities. And hopefully it won't impact your network. So in some cases it will be in a simulated environment. Some of the tools will do it in a live environment and some are aimed at data centres or cloud environments. Most of the tools should be based on some sort of model, some sort of adversary model. The most common one that you'll come across is the attack project, which is adversarial tactics, techniques, and common knowledge. And that's brought out by MITRE, an organization in the US. So we'll talk about that in more detail. With the BAS tools, why do you think you should use them? So in theory, you want to be able to set up a network and add some of the security features to your network. It might be antivirus, it may be firewall, maybe edge-based firewalls or host-based firewalls, and it may be some sort of filtering on your network. So that way you've got some sort of intrusion detection systems. If you run a simulation, Hopefully that is going to allow you to collect evidence about what sort of attack is happening and then you develop your detection around that. So if there was some sort of zero day attack on your network, how would your network defences fare? Will they detect everything? Will it detect some of it? Would it realise there's some unusual traffic and alert you to that? So the idea of these breach and attack simulation tools is that it's going to measure your defensive capabilities. It's like a drill in some sort. It also looks at your threat hunting and incident response preparedness. So if you get an email phishing attack or some sort of payload that's been delivered to one of your users on your network and it starts installing malware or some sort of payload that does unusual activities. It may even include command and control, going out to the internet and talking to a remote server to download more tools. Then it may look at looking at what 
devices are nearby that client machine and do some sort of privilege escalation or lateral pivot across your network. So the idea is to help you gain insight to those areas of potential vulnerability. Once you have those insights, you should be able to go back and go through that cyclic process of developing the detection and go back and run that simulation again, collect the evidence, develop the detection. That way, what will happen is that you can do this continual simulation and that will hopefully let you know what exposures are on your network and help you mitigate those exposures. I mentioned the attack matrix. Now this attack matrix is an interactive tool that you can use and that tool allows you to look at some of the different types of attacks. Now there is across the top the category that the type of attack that you're going to have. So at the top you're going to have initial access. Someone's going to try and get into your network somehow. And then some of the techniques that are used to get that initial access. So it might be some sort of drive-by compromise. It may even be valid accounts. So if there's a whole heap of accounts that have been breached, they may use that valid account. It may be using spear phishing attachment. So sending an email to someone, targeting them to try and open it. Or it may even be a link of some sort. Once they've got that initial access, there's going to be some sort of execution. That means some sort of script or application or payload is going to get access to your network. It may be a command line interface and it will go through and do that. So it then installs onto your network. Once it's installed on your network, it may go through the process of being persistent. So what happens when you restart the system? Does it just disappear or can it be restarted and installed as a service on the client devices or something like that? And there's different techniques for that. So it might install techniques into your bash profile. It may go via accessibility features, maybe your account manipulation or other techniques there. You've got BITS, which is Background Intelligent Transfer Services in the Microsoft environment. That can go through and do that as well. So if we look at these, you've got the different categories here. So the first three, initial access, execution and persistence, are usually done using the red team. So that's where you're doing a pen test, trying to get into the network and getting some sort of persistence and seeing if you're vulnerable. A lot of the breach and attack simulation tools, they're not focused on the initial access because this is looking at what's happened post-exploit and whether you've got any detection mechanisms to minimise that post-exploit. So it tends to focus on this maybe the defence evasion, the discovery and lateral movement and collection and exfiltration and command and control. So the last three in the column is mainly what the breach and attack simulation tools aimed at. So what we can do is have a look at more detail. It's an interactive matrix. So what I'm doing is just opening it up in a browser. So that way you can see how you can get access to the matrix. So I'm just going to share my screen. Can everyone see my screen? Thanks. So here's the matrix. I've just gone to the attack.mida.org. And it's just gone back for some reason. And what you can do is if you highlight any of these, so drive by, let's go 
valid accounts. You click on the valid accounts and it drops you into more detail about that. So it tells you what tactic it may come under, so defensive evasion, what platforms it will affect, and the permissions required and the effective permissions. It then also gives some of the more common threat agents that use this technique. So this is a listing of the different types of threat agents that are out there in the wild on the internet and their techniques or who are more likely to use this sort of technique. And then it gives you some ways of doing some mitigation and ways of detecting and further references there. So it's a great little tool to use to train up your blue team or your red team on different techniques they can use. So it goes into more detail from that point of view. So if we look at the lateral movement, so you've got different things here. So pass the hash, let's look at the pass the hash. It tells you here, it comes under lateral movement as the tactic. The platform it's focused at is the Windows environment. It's using authentication logs. These are the threat agents that could most likely use that. So Mimikatz is a very popular tool. And some of the breach and attack simulation tools actually use Mimikatz to help do that automation. And gives you an overview of what you could do for the mitigation there. So that's a quick introduction to the attack model. I hope everyone finds that of interest. Are there any questions about that? So the attack matrix for the enterprise was a project that was started back in 2013 and it gets updated on a regular basis. So it's always a good idea to go back and have a look at that. And when, I just need to start the PowerPoint again, sorry about that. So you go in and have a look at that from time to time. Some of the breach and attack simulation tools will use those techniques and update their breach and attack tools on a regular basis as well. The main idea though of the attack matrix is to help you understand the different stages of attack and to research those in more detail. Some of the tools that I'll be focusing on today is Infection Monkey, Meter, Flight Sim, Caldera, Blue Team Training Toolkit, and Atomic Red Team. Now, not all of these will be demonstrated today, but I'll talk about each of those. And then finally, I want to introduce you to Red Hunt OS. And that's a Linux distribution that has some of these tools already installed. You may have already heard about Kali Linux, where there are a lot of different tools installed to help you for penetration testing, social engineering toolkit, and so on. Well, the Red Hunt OS is another version of that, not using Kali, but it's aimed at running some of those. And so I'll talk about that in more detail. That's if you don't want to install your own distribution of that. So the first one I'm going to talk about is Infection Monkey. Now, one of the best things that I like about Infection Monkey is that it is cloud-based if you want to use that. So you can use it in the Azure and Amazon Marketplace. So in the Azure Marketplace, I've used it there to test some data infrastructure. Very simple to install. You go to the Marketplace, you set up your instance that you want, and then you connect to it over a remote port it's going to be testing your different environments and it will do the lateral movement. So it's aimed to test your resilience of your data centers and any other cloud environments against those cyber attacks. That is, once someone has gotten into your data center, what is their lateral movement going to be? 
So it's developed by Guardia Core and it's the GPL version three open source license. And there's two, compart two parts to it. You've got your Monkey Island, which is your command and control server. And that has a dedicated user interface. And then you have the Monkey, which is the tool that goes and infects the machines and propagates. So you tend to install that on one of your machines and it will go out and do the lateral movement from that. Now, I did have a one set up in Azure, but I haven't been able to get access to it from this terminal, so I won't be able to demonstrate that. But this is what the interface looks like. So what you have is that you enable your, your command and control server, and this is just using a web interface. And so normally you would go to the local host dot 5000 as the port to get access to it. Now I found it very easy to install on Azure and AWS, but I had a lot of issues trying to get it to run as a fresh install by downloading and compiling it from the GitHub resource. I have put in the FTP server access to that text file to go through and install it, but then I wasn't able to get the portal to come up. So I never really got through with that. If you have a look at the FTP site, you'll be able to see that in more detail. But the main idea is that you would download the repo. And I'm just going to share the screen for that. Can everyone see the text file that I've got open there in regards to how to install Infection Monkey? So the process is you clone the Infection Monkey GitHub. Inside that is a deployment scripts. You then run that deployment script and you can run it either for Windows or for Linux. And I then point it to a directory that I want it to install into. In this case, it's just in my profile under Infection Monkey. Now I did have some issues where certain dependencies weren't installed. So the Pi installer didn't work. The PIM installer didn't work. And so I got to the point where I wasn't able to install it locally in my network, but it worked fine in Azure and I was able to test it with a lot of my Azure machines that I have. In regards to AWS, I haven't actually had a chance to install it there, but it should be very simple to install from that point of view. In most cases, there is some great resources available. It looks like it's going to most likely be converted into a commercial tool, but at this point it isn't commercial. And it looks very easy to run, and it uses quite a lot of the techniques there. The next tool we're going to look at is Meta. And that's another security preparedness tool. It's based on quite a few different tools. So the Redis, Celery, Python, and Vagrant. And it's going to do the simulation. So what it does, it's going to, it's got a whole heap of Python scripts that you can update. And those Python scripts will be aimed at one of your virtual instances that you create, whether it's Linux, Windows, or Mac OS. And you use the Vagrant tool to create those virtual instances. So it's not necessarily aimed at your network, your live production network. So what you do is you would create a vagrant instance of any of the end devices that you want to test, and then you would run the different tools against that to test whether your, your defenses are working correctly. 
So it's only local or host based. It's not looking at your network as such. And there is some work involved because you have to convert your end devices into a vagrant deployment. It uses YAML files to do the actions and those actions are then passed to Celery to queue and run those from time to time. It was quite easy to install. It did take a lot of uh, dependencies to get working first. So these are the basic steps that I use to install and configure. So first up, what you needed to do was go and get all the dependencies. So Reader Server, Python, YAML, wget, libcurl3. Then you need to install VirtualBox if you didn't have VirtualBox running on your environment. Now this is an installation that's running on LUbuntu 16.04 or Ubuntu 16.04, I should have mentioned. Then you download the pip environment, the, the virtual environment. You clone the repository from GitHub you change into that directory and you set up a virtual environment. When you've got that virtual environment set up, you can then set up, there's a text file with whatever requirements that you need to run and that will start that for you. And so once we've got that part installed, you then need to set up your vagrant. And so what you would do is you would go to the website, download the latest version of Vagrant, use the package installer to install Vagrant, and then you need some sort of virtual environment. So if you just want to do a test with it to see what you're doing, you can do the Windows 10 download. Now when you start this, so it's going to create a little Vagrant file to and then the very first time you run it, Vagrant Up, because it's Windows 10, it's got to download a VirtualBox instance of Windows 10 and start that up. So that may take some while for you to do that. Uh, if you've got a slow connection to the internet, you're looking at about, I think, six gigs of data that's going to be downloaded. So go have lunch or go have a cup of coffee. But once it's done it the first time, it won't take as long to do that. I did find that once I did try to run it, there were some more dependencies that didn't seem to work very well or didn't come down when I did the requirements.txt file. So I've just pulled them down at the end as I discovered that they didn't work. So that's the uh, dependencies request, celery and redis again. So once we got that going, that's how it was installed. Now if you stop the virtual environment or you stop your server and you restart it again, the, the process of starting Meta is a little bit different. So when you start Meta for the first time after restarting your server, your Linux environment that you're looking at testing, first up you need to have four terminal windows. So the first terminal window you're going to run your Redis server in. The second terminal server you'll create the virtual environment again and then you would go through and start the vagrant salary that's going to sit there listening to the queue. You then start up the virtual environment using vagrant up and then you run your simulation when those three windows are there listening. So in this case here I'm just using a Python script to run the simulation and then I'm telling it to go into the MITRE directory adversarial simulation and on target underscore recon YAML. So when you're looking at that, it's going to, based on the MITRE, so if you have a look at the adversarial simulation, that is one area where it's just going to go through. In this case, it's targeting a Windows environment, trying to find out what information is on that client machine. So that's why I've targeted that Windows 10 as my virtual environment. If you go into that MITRE directory, you'll be able to see a whole heap of other techniques based on the categories from the matrix, the attack matrix that I've talked about previously. 
So what I'm going to do is just share my window. Hopefully it will work. I've created a simple installation script to demonstrate this for you. So I'm just going to share my window so that way you can see it. Can everyone see a VLC window with a Linux desktop there? So the resolution might not be as good, I do apologise for that, but hopefully you see a black square with an X term icon in the top left hand corner. Can everyone see that? So Going through the process of starting Meta, the first thing is I open up a new terminal window, changing to the Meta directory, and I type in Redis server. I then put that to the side, and that will sit there waiting. I open up another window, changing the Meta directory, and then I will start the Celery. So the way to do that, I've got to set up the virtual environment again, even though in my initial installation script, I had done that because I'd restarted the server, I need to set it up again because it goes off and gets all the required tools that I need. So I'm setting the source to the meta bin activate directory and then I'm going to run the pip install to get all the required tools I need to run the Celery script. Now this is available in the PowerPoint as well as in the text document for you. And then I just run the salary and sit, leave that to the side. I then go and start my server, or in this case my virtual environment, which is Windows 10. So I change in the, the meta directory and I do the vagrant up. So this depends on where you've put your vagrant files whether you should be running it in the meta directory. If you've downloaded it into a different location, then you'd need to go to that location and do your vagrant up. Now, as I said, that can take quite a while, so I've actually cut the video here. And you can see there it's trying to start that. So in some cases, if you've already opened your Windows 10 environment, it's obviously doing automatic updates, so it may take a while. If it takes too long, you can always open up VirtualBox and have a look to see what state that it's running in. So in this case here, I'll go through and open up VirtualBox because it's just taking way too long to start up and it turned out I think it was doing a Windows 10 update in the background. So I'm just going to speed it up a bit. So here's the Windows 10 and it's showing me what status it is. Essentially Vagrant opens up a virtual environment in a headless mode, so that way you don't actually need the window open in any format. So when it's finally going to finish the update, you'll see it comes back to the command prompt, and so that means I can now run my script, and the script is just running that adversarial simulation, and in this case here it's using commands like command.exe-c net user, so remote command execution. So the idea then would be to go check your Windows machine, have a look at the event logs and see if you're detecting this sort of attack on your environment. Is someone running these commands on a regular basis and do you have the appropriate resources or the appropriate intr intrusion detection systems in place to find out if there's some sort of network calls to your servers and so on. At the moment I have an implemented any sort of tooling for that. So out of the box you'd go to Event Viewer and see if you can find things there. So that's a quick introduction to what Meta is like. So I'll just stop that sharing. 
any questions about using Meta? So the idea of using that tool is you look at ways of having to detect those. So in the example we use where it's going through and doing the remote command.exe execution, what protection is in place to detect it? Out of the box, Windows 10 didn't detect it. I may have been able to do something by installing some sort of third party tool. I went and had a look in the event logs for 4661 and 4662 and 4663, but they're all looking at system processes and who's accessing it, and it comes back to whether auditing's turned on. Now there is a hyperlink for those different tools there that you can go have a look at that tell you about what they are. Any questions about using Meta? The next tool is called the Flight Sim and it's from AlphaSoc. And this is more to test your DNS services and look, it's basically to generate malicious network traffic and see what sort of systems you can do in regards to your detection. You can install this on Windows or Linux and it's just a distro that you would download and run. So in this case here, you just do flight sim run DGA and DGA is a domain generation algorithm and the idea is to randomly create all these unusual uh, domain names and see if they can contact and connect to those. And the idea, you would look at your uh, edge device and see what suspicious traffic is happening and see if you can detect that. So it's a nice little tool just to test your network and look at if there's any domain name service tunneling. I was at uh, NZNOG last week and they were talking about using um, SDN software defined networking and OpenFlow at the Uni of New South Wales. They use that to look at what sort of D domain name service tunneling tools detection that are out there. And they discovered that the Uni of New South Wales actually didn't have any of their tools that could detect it. However, the scripting they had written for the OpenFlow network component was able to detect that because it looked at and inspected each of the traffic. So you might want to look at this to test what sort of tools that are out there. I actually don't have a working version of this. I wasn't able to get the code to compile properly. But I did, I end up removing the text file from that. There are, I think, a Windows installation of this. I wasn't able to find it at the time. I did install it and use it last year in November, only briefly, and it was not bad, a very simple tool to use, and as you can see from the screenshot, it makes it quite easy for you to test your intrusion detection systems. The next product is Caldera, and that's from MITRE Research Project. Again, if we think about the attack matrix, that is from MITRE as well. So Caldera is well suited and it updates based on the MITRE attacked matrix, and it's an automated adversary emulation system. So the idea, again, it's not to get the initial access, it's for post compromise, and it's aimed at the Windows Enterprise only. So you need to have a Windows domain set up, and that way it can go through and do the lateral movement throughout that. It creates a plan to connect to the system, so it generates plans of operation using some sort of planning system and pre-configured model. It's quite easy to install once you get the dependencies right. When you install Caldera, you actually have two components, just like Infection Monkey. 
So you have the server component that runs the database and execution engine, and that then connects to the attacker model. That then needs to communicate with an agent or remote access tool, the RAT, on the clients. Based on that, it can then run the execution engine against the agent and the RAT, and it gives you a nice little interface to report back to. It relies on Docker to do the installation of that. So if you've got your Docker component installed correctly, then it will work fine. I found the first few times I tried to install it, I didn't uh, set up my Docker correctly or I was using an older version of Docker and I didn't have Docker Compose installed. So the first part that you need to do is to make sure that you have Docker installed correctly and you've got the Docker Compose and check the versions against the GitHub repo to make sure you've got the correct versions. Update your Linux environment and then clone the Git repo. Change into that repo and I found that there was an issue where for some reason there's some permissions and it couldn't get access to the conf file. So I had to do the change ownership to make sure that the Docker group had access or could read the configuration file. Once that was fixed, I then was able to run the docker compose up command. Obviously the first time that you run it, it takes a while, but it will go out and configure your virtual environment. And if all is working correctly, no errors, you'll be able to go to your local host quad 8 and view that portal for that. I'm just going to share my screen to show you how to run the Caldera. Can everyone see my screen? I can't actually. Can everyone see the black screen with the icon X term window up in the top left hand corner? I'm glad everyone else can see it because I actually can't see it. Let's see if I can get it to come up. Not able to get. Is that animation running? Yes, it is running. So this is what's happening in the background. I'll, I'm not able to play it back. I'll just shut it down and see if I can get it to run again. So that's now running. So what I'm doing is changing into the directory. Once I've changed into the directory, I can then do the docker compose up command. It will then start the server and it will sit there listening on that port quad 8. Once the server has started, I then just go to a browser and I open up the browser window. Going to localhost quad 8. I log in with the 
command, the username admin, the password is Caldera, or lowercase. And that brings me into this Caldera web interface. Again, it's focused on the attack matrix. So if I click on the attack matrix, you can see that's broken down into Windows, Mac, and Linux. So I can then go and look at that in more detail. And just like what I did in the website, I can then go drill down and find out more details about the specific simulation that will be run. To run the simulation, I need to add my clients, either by using a client agent or a remote access tool, a RAT tool. In this case, I don't have any listed, but I can have a look at that. And then I can go to my networks, add a network that I want to scan, and I need to be able to add some clients to that, and then that will give me an overview of that. Once I've done that, I can then click on what sort of operation, what sort of simulation I want to do, and I need to set that to my networks there. There are some great resources on the internet to give you access to that, but that's the basics of that. Any questions about using Caldera? Just going to hide that. So hopefully everyone can see my screen again with the PowerPoint. Another tool is the Blue Team Training Toolkit, or referred to as P BD BT3. It was developed by Warren Gulafone. I hope I pronounced his name correctly, and it's licensed under the FreeBSD. The idea is that. He developed it when he was doing a lot of defensive security training and there wasn't enough simulation tools out there or enough traffic that could be used to help people learn about that. So this is a simulated environment. What it's going to do is create replicated traffic over your network, not necessarily attacking the end devices, but it's going to show the traffic that is similar being on your network. So that way you can then go and have a look at that using your different tools. It might be Wireshark or other intrusion detection systems. It may even be able to be used to test your antivirus to see how well it detects malware. Because what it does, it can use PCAP files to manipulate traffic or replay traffic on your network. The malware sample simulation is going to have the MD5 checksums similar to real malicious files, but they're not malicious, and send those across your network and see if your system detects those. So it's a great tool from that point of view, and it's not hard to install. It's one of the easiest tools I've come across to install. So in my case, I end up using a Kali Linux system. I mainly because it had a few other tools that I can use with that for monitoring and intrusion detection. I downloaded the zip file from direct from their website. I unzipped the file and then there's a if you go into the directory, there's an installation script that you can run. Once you've run the installation script, you change into the blue team training directory and you run Python bt3.py. The very first time that you run that, you're going to go through and have to sign up into their, or sign up to their environment, so that way you can download some of the profiles. When it first started out, a lot of it was free. Now there's only a certain amount of the profiles that are free, and then there's profiles that you need to buy credits for and you can download. It comes back to how up to date do you want the malware to look. Do you want a newer version of the malware or an older version of the malware? It comes back to what level of security training you're trying to achieve. 
So if you're just a beginner, you can use the free profiles and it's very easy for you to start learning about what happens in the background. And because it's run in Python, it makes it easier to have a look at the scripts and the YAML files. So in my case here, I'm going to don't know why VLC is not running properly in my environment. So I'm just trying to get the animation up so I can help, but I can't see. So what happens is we're changing into the directory. Once we change into the directory it, and start the Python script, you then come into this shell environment there. And then you can type in help to learn more about the commands. And then based on the commands that you want to run, you can have a look at the profiles. When we look at the different profiles, we should be able to then go through and load a module. And when we load the module, Maligno, it's going to use a profile to then automate some of that testing. And in this case here, we're just going to use the old rear profile, and that's a, like a, a um, an attack on an environment. So to run that. That's as simple as starting that environment there. Now, if you go to the website, there's actually more detail and a whole heap of training videos that you can use. And it's quite simple to use from that point of view. The training videos actually don't show you needing to sign up or setting up the profile, but you'll need to do that in the newer versions. The final tool I want to talk about is the Atomic Red Team. It's basically a whole heap or a library of tests, and it's all mapped to the MITRE ATT&CK framework. But the thing is, with this tool, it's not as automated. You tend to do one tool at a time. They I think they've got a commercial product where you can then automate it. And this product is from Red Canary. The idea is that it should be able to run the tests in less than five minutes. Some of the simulations could be more complex and take a lot longer. If you look at Caldera and Inf Infection Monkey, where it's going through and doing the lateral movement. But the, this is going to, same as all the other breach and attack simulation tools, test your security and your processes. When you are looking at your attack red team, you're going to need to select your test, then you execute the test, and then you collect evidence to develop the test from that point of view. So I'm just going to open up the environment. And I'm going to share my window. So 
So what we've got is a complete list of uh, TAC tools. And with this one here, these are the different categories, so persistence, and it gives you an overview of the threat agent that's going to be there. Great tool if you want to learn more about penetration testing or learn about some of the exploits and how they're done. So it will make it a very easy tool to learn. So in this example here, they've chosen one that's aimed at a Windows environment and it should flag based on the Windows Defender as long as Windows Defender is installed. If it's not installed on your environment, then that could be a problem. And you should be able to determine whether your systems will detect that. So I found on most Windows 10 systems that this will flag Windows Defender. So I'm just going to share my screen for a command prompt. Now, you may or may not see this, but all I need to do is paste that into here. And then when I paste that in, I've got a access is denied, and it's also flagged in my Windows Defender, antivirus found, threats, get details. So I'm just going to... No, it didn't really bring it up, it just showed that so I can't really share that window but as you can see there access is denied it didn't really work because I got it blocked using the Windows Defender so that's a quick intro to using Red Canary now it's not automatic so there is a lot of manual process involved so that is one of the disadvantages I'm sure you could most likely script that but the main idea same process is that you should be able to execute the test and collect the evidence. One of the issues here though is if you're doing this on a live system and something goes wrong, that could be a problem. So just check all of the scripts that you're running to make sure that it's not doing anything malicious. That's my only caveat I would recommend. So just to give you a comparison based on the MITRE attack model, we've got the different tactic or category names down the left hand side and the tools across the top here and the rating that I've sort of given them there. It's not necessarily uh, accurate but this my opinion at that point. So there's a lot of tools in the Atomic Red team but there's not as much, not as much uh, automation that's happening. Blue Team Training Toolkit that's a great tool and it's really good for simulating network traffic. Caldera and Infection Monkey, high-end tools, but Meta is quite good as well. So there's an a array of different tools that you can start looking at and I recommend that you go and get those resources. Each of the links on the PowerPoint are there and I hope that's given you some more information to research. Finally, if you want to experiment with some of these tools, you can try the Red Hunt Dash OS and you can download it from GitHub, the virtual machine there, and deploy it. And you can see that's got the attack emulation, then it's got threat hunting, open source intelligence, and threat intelligence. So that's a great little tool there that you can have a look at. Some other resources is the list of adversary simulation tools. And so they include the ones I've talked about, plus the commercial tools and some newer tools that are available there. And then there's an intro to breach and attack simulations, nice little white paper there. And for those who didn't know, there's actually US patents for breach and attack simulations brought out by SafeBreach. So you're welcome to go have a look at those patents to learn more details exactly what they're talking about there. Any questions about what I've talked about?
So we've covered a little bit today, and it was more of just an introduction to the breach and attack simulations.